On this episode, we are talking about The Little Things, the 2021 thriller starring Denzel Washington. We're talking about mental health advocacy, Denzel Washington, and the dangerous side of obsession, emotional addiction, and more. I'm Captain Nostalgia, and this is the Victims and Villains Podcast, a podcast extension of the nonprofit that educates and engages individuals on mental health awareness and suicide prevention through pop culture on this episode it's the spoilers that'll get you caught Kales, my man it has been so long since we have podcasted together i feel like i haven't talked to you in a whole year yeah you know given that the pandemic has already put everything into a tom warp like 2020 feels like it happened five years ago so yeah it makes sense that um us not doing a podcast for at least i'll say maybe two months if it's a very long time but i'm happy to be back with you bro man i'm so stoked to have you back and a lot has changed over in your world since you're back um uh, Patch from Feel and Film, a, another podcast that you have the opportunity to be a part of, uh, is kind of taking a sabbatical, and you're actually now the uh, co-host of that show. So congratulations! Uh thanks, man. Thank you. Um, it, it came as a surprise to me. Um, you know, the host, my friend Aaron, came to me one night and told me that. You know, Patrick was going to take a little bit of a break and he wanted me to step in. And, you know, it's kind of some big shoes, but I don't feel too much pressure for it. I just come in and I'm doing my own thing for three months and we're going to rock it. So, hey, <laughs> check us out. It's going to be great. <laughs> go check it out. It's a uh, go check it out. We'll provide a link in the description below wherever you guys are currently listening to this podcast. But also, Josh, I have to tell you, yeah, go before ahead. you get to the next one, um, on our recent podcast we did on Inside Out, we gave you a lot of name drops. We gave a lot of victims and villains name drops in that podcast. So. Oh, man. <laughs> I, I was actually saving that podcast for, for next week uh, so that I could watch Inside Out again before I listened. Mm-hmm. But that's awesome. <laughs> Thanks for that, man. Uh, it's, it's crazy that, you know, you are kind of stepping into those shoes because like we had planned out a a good chunk of your time for the first quarter here. And so uh, I was kind of worried. I was like, man, I was like, you know, I I'm up for, you know, having to fill certain episodes if we need to, but uh, I'm glad that, you know, everything's worked out and I just didn't want to have too much, you know, pressure on you for, you know, mental health wise reasons and whatnot. Uh, no, it's no pressure. I mean, I love doing podcasts. I mean, I've grown to become almost like more than a rookie, you know, because I used to be very mm-hmm. new to it. But now with so many episodes done, especially between you and I, I've grown accustomed to it. And it's a passion I love um, doing. So it's never too much work for me. It's crazy to think that we've been podcasting for almost two years now. We're yes. well, a little over a little over a year and a half, but June will be two years. Time flies. <laughs> it does. And I am super excited to welcome on the guest for this episode. Uh, she is the senior editor at both Image Comics and Valiant Comics, Miss Heather Antos. Hi. <laughs> welcome. It is such a pleasure to have you here. Um, I know that a lot of us here, victims and villains, are both fans of uh image and valiance um but that's not the real reason i wanted to bring you on i we've been trying to get more of a representation of mental health advocates and uh professionals on our show because at their at their heart everyone has a fandom and uh you just kind of had the best of both worlds uh i was like yeah i feel like she's gonna be the perfect guest to have Oh, well, thank you. Thank you so much. Yeah. I mean, I'm not a mental health professional. I just want to (laughs) put that out there. But uh, I am a I am a professional, as all working people are, um, that has mental health like everyone else in the world. We all have it. So we've had a couple editors before in the past on our show. And I'm always kind of curious, how did you kind of end up at these more recognizable companies? uh doing editing yeah um so i got my start um right after college in comics i went to college originally for film and theater my goal 
my entire childhood, my entire life was to work in uh, production, like by, behind the scenes as a producer or director or something like that. And naturally, my, my senior year of college, I decided, well, this thing I've been studying for 20 years, I don't want to do anymore, uh, which feels great, you know, right before you're about to go into the abyss that is adulthood. Um And I didn't really know what to do. And around that time, a friend of mine turned to me and he's just, he goes, well, you really like comics. Why don't you just do that? And it had never really crossed my mind up until that point that, oh, people get paid for this, right? Like it's, I'm from a small town in the Midwest. It's not like on career day, the writer of Batman just comes to your school. It doesn't happen. Um, But at that point I knew, you know, he's right. This is it. This is what I want to do. And I began, you know, networking, talking to any writers or artists who would talk to me. I started self-publishing. And throughout that, I met the right people and worked on enough projects that when an opening became available at Marvel, um, I was luckily hired. That's that's crazy. Uh, and I, I mean, it just really, that story really goes to prove that like, if you set your mind to it, anything is possible. I think, I know for me, sometimes I will come across like potential guests or mm-hmm. people that I'd like to have on the show. And you, I'll like, look at like how many followers they have on Twitter and be like immediately discouraged and be like, Oh, these, these guys have too many people, uh, following them. Like they're, too much of a big name. That's honestly what I kind of thought about when I reached out to you over Twitter. I was like, eh, worst case is I don't hear back, but typically. Exactly. Yeah. <laughs> no, that's what I always say though, is like, cause quite frank, quite honestly, like how I started making my connections in comics was doing like any good millennial does. And I tweeted people, I tweeted editors in the industry and asked, you know, who will talk to me. And, and this is the same thing I say to other people who want to break in, to comics, to film, to, to games, to, to any industry. I'm like, just ask because like worst case scenario, you are in the exact same situation you are in now, you know, like you're not going to like lose your home. If you ask someone to have a conversation with you and they say, no, like you're just in the same situation. So you might as well ask and they might say yes. (laughs) Yeah, so like I I went to bed at the night after I messaged you, and I was just like woke up to a, a message, and I was like, oh man, like this is awesome. And then when you got to meet a little bit of our community through our Discord server, uh, a lot of people were like, oh my goodness, you work for who? And I'm like, oh, it's not the <laughs> reason that I invited her here, but it is kind of cool that you you know you do have that connection to something that I think a lot of our listeners are fans of. No, for sure. And, you know, like, I am very lucky to work in comics and games and everything that I do. Like, I love, you know, I love my job. But, and I know it's a job that a lot of people obviously are very interested in doing. Um, but as I like to say to everyone, you know, I'm, I'm, I'm a normal person, like everyone else. I have, you know, I have my one bedroom apartment and my dog, like, like everyone else. <laughs> One of the things that I think I, I was really pumped about you being on the show was was how much of a mental health advocate you are. Um, and I, I think there's a lot of stigma as we've explored in now 359 episodes of, you know, breaking that mental health stigma and really kind of fixating the conversation to make it as normal as possible. And you are based in New York City. And how's the landscape of advocacy look different in a larger city like that? Oh, my goodness. I mean, I wouldn't say it's it's like L.A. where it's a fad to have a therapist, right? Like, I feel like this the, the stereotype in L.A. is like even your dog has a therapist. It's, you know. Um, but New York City, you know, especially, I think, in – the comics community and as we're seeing in the online community, um, you know, stigma is breaking. People are so much more open about, you know, having a therapist or taking medication for mental illnesses or um, just needing a personal day because shit is tough. Um, You know, like I, I have to give props to, 
you know, my bosses at Valiant, they are your, you know, older straight white dudes that you imagine when you think about New York executives, right? And like, I was nervous when I had to tell them, like, you know, I have to take an hour off every Wednesday, because I have my therapy appointment. And they're just like, okay, like, it wasn't a thing. And which, to me is so vastly different than where I grew up. You know, I, I always joke that my hometown is stuck in the eighties when it comes to a lot of beliefs and, and, you know, mental health is one of those things where, um, you know, I was raised in a very, very strict Catholic family and, and anyone who comes from very, very strict Catholic you know, that Midwestern flyover state mentality, it's, you know, you're depressed because you wronged God, right? Like it's, it's a punishment from God. Um, And you shouldn't take medication for it because that's like, I guess, flipping off God for whatever reason. Um, And so it's, 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 it's been an adjustment for me personally to, um, you know, be as open talking about things as I am now. Um, But it's also something I really wanted to do and push. Um, You know, I, when I realized like I have as large of a platform as I do on social media, it became kind of like just this, this thing that I really wanted to push and I wanted to showcase that like, you know, I have CPTSD, I have horrible anxiety, I have terrible, terrible bouts of depression. um, And it's so important for me to talk about it and talk about what I'm going through and be as open about it as, you know, as I feel comfortable doing um, to show that you can be a successful person Um, and still be having these mental health battles because I feel like sometimes when we get stuck in our, you know, our spirals of depression, it it does look hopeless and Mm -hmm. that I will never be successful. And that's for happy people and not for me. Um, and as I said before, like we're all real people and I'm a real person too. And if me sharing my story helps someone else get through the day, then that's the least I can do. 100% agree. I think vulnerability and kind of tearing down those walls and connecting with individuals on an intimate level, I think that's how we start to see strives of stigma and stereotypes really kind of start to fade from the public eye. And that's something that we need so badly to change the landscape on when it comes to mental health because we're just going around in circles hoping for different results at, you know, certain points of time because we continuously have these stereotypes of this is how men are, this is how women are, and nothing you say or whatever scientific evidence you have is going to change that. A hundred percent, a hundred percent. And I also think too, like, not only does it help publicly and socially kind of combat the stigma, but like being vulnerable and actually putting it out there and saying like, hey, today sucks. You know, today fucking sucks. Today, I don't want to get out of my bed. I don't want to do my job. Um, Everything feels terrible and I'd rather not exist. Like, even just putting it out there gets it almost out of you in a way where, okay, maybe now I have a little more room in my brain to take a shower, right? Like, and, and, um, and, and being vulnerable, you know, reaching out to other people, you see the support that's out there from strangers. And it's the most powerful thing. It's so, 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 so powerful. Um, and yeah, I think, you know, as we said before, everyone has mental health. Um, and it's so important to, you know, uplift others, um, because that's also going to help up- uplift yourself. Agree, agree 100%. And I think to 
uh, kind of transition into our uh, topic for this episode with the little things, while I think most of us on this call were underwhelmed, to say the least, by this movie, I think one of the interesting things that I really ended up kind of respecting about this movie was the arc of the Denzel Washington character and talking about how, you know, you are, you basically have to know your limits and we'll talk about it a little bit later, but his character kind of, you know, is a detective, you know, this legendary detective in in Los Angeles and this case kind of comes across his desk and basically is his breaking point. And you have to know at what point your breaking point is because if you don't establish that for yourself, it's going to do more damage in the long run. Uh, yeah, I mean, did he know it was his breaking point? Because <laughs> it gave him a freaking heart attack. <laughs> I mean, look, the dude, the dude <laughs> suffered a heart attack, a divorce, and sacrificed his basically his career his entire livelihood to to pursue this case so i think i think he saw it was his breaking point you know like a hundred miles past it i think you know that's when he turned around and was like oh yeah that that exit was the breaking point whoops he has that (laughs) out-of-body experience yeah like i feel (laughs) i feel like that's you know and, and kind of like that's I don't know. I, you know, you guys tell me what you think. For me personally, I don't know if he had a, 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 a huge arc through the film. I don't know that he learned anything or that he changed because, you know, obviously, I assume spoilers are fine, right? Yes. Um, yeah. Yeah, we're talking about this film. If you're listening to this podcast with a film in the title and you haven't seen the film, <laughs> what the fuck are you doing? Uh, <laughs> you're a masochist, I guess. Who knows? But, um, but, you know, his whole thing is, you know, he committed, he accidentally killed this girl and he's repressed that. And, you know, his buddies helped cover it up and they're all keeping this buried and they all have this repressed so much so that it gave him this trauma where he got a divorce and, and, you know, triple bypass heart surgery and quit being a detective. And now he's just like this deputy sheriff from this hodunk suburb and then, you know, he obsesses over it, clearly, to a very unhealthy, you know, stereotypical photos on the wall that I'm going to stare at and drive myself into madness, obsessive, obsessively follows this guy. And then when Rami's, Rami Malek's character kills him, he helps him repress that, too. Like, I don't think he learns anything. I don't think he grows at all. I think, you know, that's why we see him. I'm going to retire in the woods with my dog all by myself. Like, dude's going to drink himself to death. He's, he, he, needs, he needs some therapy. <laughs> Man, yeah, I but- had serious flashbacks to the marksman uh, when they would show him at the, uh, like, his home, which is another movie that's a complete mess. But uh, I, I digress. Coles. Yeah, for me, like, you get the scenes where he's laying on the bed and he's seeing the dead victims that, you know, he was never able to really catch the guy who did them. And he's seeing them and it's almost like very horror-like, almost like something you would see in something like Hereditary or something like that. And then you see these moments where he's talking to dead bodies and everything and it comes off as just very comical but i mean you can understand i mean this guy he dedicated most of his career he dedicated the last part of his career before all the bad stuff happens to him to figuring out who the killer was and this obsession and dedication just drives him to a point where this is something he has to do he has to figure this out because if he doesn't he's going to live with these demons for the rest of his life and there's nothing worse with somebody who grows old they end up looking back at their life and they end up having regrets and i think the whole film he's trying to fight against having that regret feeling which is why he goes so hard in like 
helping Raimi fi- um, figuring out who the killer is. Because he in, in the beginning of the film, he's not even down there to even help out who the killer is. He's down there because his captain sent him down there to get some evidence for another crime that had happened. So he gets down there, and then all of a sudden he gets sucked back into his old stomping grounds, and it brings, rekindles back all these bad memories. And then he feels like he has an obligation to do whatever he can to make up for it. <laughs> Yeah, well, and that's and that's the thing. It's and and there's a there's a moment in the film where we where you know he asks Raimi, he asks like, "Why are you doing this?" You know, and he's like, "Well, I'm doing this for these girls. I'm doing this for these, you know, uh, for for their families, and so they get peace and blah 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 blah." Which is the right perspective, yeah. right? Mm-hmm. <laughs> that's that's <laughs> the healthy perspective. That's the perspective of the job, and and then. You know, and Denzel's just like, yeah, well, I'm doing it for me. And, like, <laughs> that's giant red flag. And, you know, that's that's when Raimi's character as a professional, as a detective, needs to be like, okay, cool. You're no longer involved. You know, any that's that's when any good, and I would assume the LAPD would do this. They're, they're big enough, you know, whenever you're personally invested like that, where you're being driven by ego rather than, you know professional sanctions that's when you're like you can't be involved anymore because you're going to be dangerous to this case which we see he is he's he becomes reckless yeah i i feel like i'm gonna be the voice of optimism on this episode uh i deserve to your point heather he doesn't really change throughout the entire course of it I, i don't know about you guys but at the end where Malik is kind of, you know, basically going through the fact that he had just killed a guy in cold blood or self-defense, yeah. however he's processing it, there comes a point where Denzel leans in and, like, hugs him and says, uh, that's my boy. And that's something that Malik constantly says throughout the entire thing is he keeps referring to Leto as our boy. And there's a point at that moment where I was like, is Denzel the killer? Like, it, I don't got know that I, vibe. <laughs> I got that vibe. Yeah. Especially when at the end, when he's, when he's like dump, when he's back home and he's taking all of Leto's stuff and he's like, just lighting it on fire and he pulls out the red barrette, uh, that he ends up sending Malik's character to find peace air quotes oh. at the end uh, I honestly thought I was like, what if, what if Denzel was the killer? Like, what if, no, what no, if he just broke? No, that's that's just your 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 tinfoiling hat here. You're you're, you're getting a tinfoil hat. Here. <laughs> <laughs> this is Roswell, New Mexico, and everything like that. It's it's a theory. I'll give you that. Mm-hmm. It's a theory. There, so there there was a moment for a split second. There was a moment where I I thought that, but coming back out of the film and really kind of studying it through it. I think that here you have a guy that is so damaged by what he has done. Cause to the point they were, um, you talk about his sequences in the motel where he's, um, looking at the pictures and then he's like seeing the ghosts of the girl and kind of talking to the dead bodies. I, I think it brings up a good conversation that, you know, we were just kind of talking about previous uh, to this, you know, Heather, you mentioned using a platform like Twitter to bring awareness to mental health. I think um, Denzel is kind of this cautionary tale of what happens when you bottle up your mental health and bottle up your emotions for uh, a number of years. And, you know, you basically, never allow yourself to grow and find that peace like you're just can can um consistently well, torment it you see how isolated it is yeah you see how lonely it is you see there was this this beautiful scene that i loved and truly i thought i thought it was one of the best moments of the film um and 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 denzel like his performance is so underrated in this he did such a good job portraying this you know the layers of this detective and and the trauma that he's been through where he shows up at his old house where his ex-wife still lives with her new husband 
and you know you can see the heartbreak and you know he still very much cares for her and misses her and wants that life that you know he's happy that she's able to have with someone who's not him because he knows he's too fucked up but he's too scared obviously to be vulnerable um and he pretends that everything is fine and then she leaves and you see him you know kick the leaves and kick the tree and because he can't be open and vulnerable with the woman that he was once closest to and it and it's so heartbreaking but so beautiful that i feel like it captures perfectly everything that he is going through and you know, I wanted to add on to what you were saying, Heather. It's like we talk about how, like, if you're working a, a certain job, a certain occupation, they always tell you, like, you know, work your job here, but don't bring the job home with you. Mm-hmm. And it, it seems like Denzel, he his mistake was that he brought the job home with him. But if you're working, you know, a job where you're trying to find killers, you're you're seeing people who are brutally murdered, who have had their life taken away just be just on a whim, and you and you're almost like a guardian angel like he says in the film to Raymond, he's like you're you're like a guardian angel to these victims mm-hmm. you know you you always they're going to follow you everywhere until you're able to find justice for them and i feel that in that that path and find and fight for justice you end up just becoming someone different like whoever you were before it ends up being changed forever because you just can't unsee shit you know when you see a dead body when you see that there are monsters and people out here who are almost like evil incarnated you know just roaming the world i mean how do you how are you able to justify that at night like how do you sleep at night with that on your head therapy that's how (laughs) therapy but no like i think you know i think passion is good passion is a very very good thing to have passion about your profession is a very important thing to have um, but there's a fine line, I think, between, um, you know, being passionate about your job and being passionate about obviously protecting people, which is what these guys, you know, are at the end of the day, they're protectors. Um, it, it's, you know, where is that fine line between your entire self-worth is in that identity, mm-hmm. right? Mm-hmm. Uh, and that's, when when you start to notice how much it's affecting your self-worth, right? When when it's reaching the point where Rami is awake, sitting on the deck at 4 a.m. and hasn't come to bed, like that's when you need that's that's the time to ask for help, right? That's the time to talk to someone. That's the time to say, I can't do this. I'm not okay. I need help. Um, you know, and I can't, I mean, that's why they have psych evals for the military. That's why they have psych evals for police officers and for detectives. That's this, this is why. (laughs) So you don't have situations like this. Now, granted, I know this took place, this was to take place in like 1990. And Mm -hmm. so, you know, obviously Sting was very, very different. All of these things that's you know i think it's so important to be so mindful of where we put our self-worth and where we place our identity um because if you put so much of your identity into one thing the second that that one thing becomes tainted in any way shape or form it is going to drive you into madness which we this is a perfect example of that If you or someone you know is listening to this podcast right now and you're struggling with suicide, addiction, self-harm, or depression, we encourage you guys to please reach out. This is the heartbeat of why we do what we do. Suicide is currently the 10th leading cause of death in the United States. And as of this recording, there are 132 suicides that take place each and every day on American soil. And when you scale back internationally, there are 800,000 successful suicides. That is one death roughly every 40 seconds. So if you or someone you know is struggling, you guys can go to victimsandvillains.net forward slash hope. That resource is going to be right in the description wherever you guys are currently listening or streaming this. There you'll find resources that include the National Suicide 
Lifeline, which is 1 800 273 8255. You can also text HELP to 741 741. We also have a plethora of other resources, including churches, getting connected with counselors, LGBT resources like the Trevor Project, and also Veteran Hotline as well. Please. If you hear nothing else in the show, understand that you, yes, you listening to this right now, have value and worth. We get it. Suicide, depression, mental health, these are hard topics, and the stigma around them doesn't make it any easier. But please consider the resources right in the descriptions below, wherever you guys are listening, because, once again, you have value and you have worth. So please, stay with us. Yeah, and Malik's character is interesting to note in the beginning of this because he's a very cocky young lad, and as the film develops, he basically starts to mirror the story of Denzel's character going through this change and just kind of diving into it to where you start to see that he's sacrificing his uh, relationship at home with his wife and his kids. And there's several scenes where uh, he's back at the station. Someone comes in and says, you know, Hey, your wife's on the phone, take a message. And for me, I can, I feel like I can speak to personal experience before uh, about a year before we started victims and villains. I was almost at the top level uh, that one can be in my last job. And I tried my best never to take work home with me but my phone did not get that memo and it was constantly (laughs) blowing up from just employees that were you know trying to reach me and what I was contracted to do was to work 45 hours a week and what I ended up actually working was 55 to 60 hours a week almost like seven days a week and even when I'm not there I'm still like there and you know I just couldn't take a break and it eventually became like my identity it basically eventually came my entire existence at that point and when I went through a demotion I was joking tell people that it was the best thing that ever happened to me it was a blessing because my mental health it just like reset and it took its toll on my marriage and it it reset my my marriage my wife just like we looked we look back now and we talk about it and she's just like, that was probably one of the most miserable years in all of our marriage because of just how consumed you were in that. And it goes back to that, you know, what we're saying about, you know, understanding your limits and Denzel, I think is a, you know, cautionary tale again, because doesn't really notify his limits until it's already too late. You know, you're already, deep into a divorce you're already you know now your physical health is starting to fail because of your mental health and eventually you know the two kind of go hand in hand and um i think romney at the end of the movie just kind of like looking at his daughters um you know just kind of gazing on them and just it it i would say like it's for him it kind of is almost kind of this like moment where he's like man he's like this is what's important um but I could maybe just be reading into that, but understanding what's important as well. No, for sure. I, I, I agree with that. Yeah, definitely. It's, and it's unfortunately, you know, this is all easier said than done. Right. Mm-hmm. Um, it, it takes a lot of work on yourself to become that aware and to, to know that, oh, this, this feeling inside, you know, this stress, this tension uh, is, is, is my red flag that I need to stop. I need to, you know, take a break. I need to talk to someone. I need to go hug a puppy, you know, whatever that may be. Um, You know, sometimes, unfortunately, you need to go through it in order to see it the next time. Um, And, and that's not, that's not always the best. I would say it's never the best. Um, But it it is unfortunately how it happens a lot of times. But I think once you go through one of those crises, crises like that, 
it's so important to then like almost analyze it to to like see it for what it was so that you can take care of yourself the next time yeah that's that's how it was for me i felt the same way as josh did in my last job i was before i'm at now but i wasn't in a top position i was in one of the middle positions at my last job it was a retail job and i would just come into work every day just feeling like my soul was being sucked you know i I would come into an environment where like you know people were gossiping on one another the management didn't care about the workers and you constantly had to deal with um bad treatment from customers sometimes and you know going to work every day and it's your livelihood. You know, you have to kind of do it uh, or unless you want to be out into the street. So you kind of have to deal with it and go through it. But it feels like a prison within itself. And when I got to my new job, which I love and I'm currently doing, I've been doing it for four years now. I told myself that, you know what, I'm going to take this as a learning experience. I'm going to let myself know that I will never allow myself to be in a position at a job where I feel like I don't have a soul at the end of the day where I feel like I have to cry and just relieve a lot of stress because of what I'm doing every day. You know, it, you know, like I said, I mean, what doesn't kill you makes you stronger. And I know that sounds very Hallmark car worthy, but it's true. You know, it makes you stronger. It makes you understand resilience. It makes you understand independence and it makes you want better for yourself. And, you know, in this film, we can see that these characters, I mean, especially now with Raimi's, he's going to have to live with this forever. And while now he can look back and maybe he's got clean and he'll never be found out like as being a part of this murder, he will now have to live with this kind of regret and being in somewhat of a cell for the rest of his life. Yeah. I mean, I think it's, you know, in, in regards to the work situation, I, you know, I think that, in our daily lives, especially in regards to our jobs, it's so important to place boundaries and enforce those boundaries and make sure that employers and employees respect those boundaries. Um, You know, for myself, because I am a workaholic and I know this about myself. And one of the big things I've been working on the last couple of years is setting these boundaries and giving myself this work life balance that I now have, which is really foreign and weird. And I don't, I love it, but I also don't like it because it's weird. (laughs) Um, But, you know, like I, I have alarms and timers on my phone where I, stop getting work emails notifications to my phone past, you know, 6 p.m. on on weekdays. I don't get work notification emails on the weekend, Um, period. Stop. End everything there. That way I cannot be bothered. I do not answer call work calls you know past a certain point you know if it's important they'll text they'll leave a voicemail I can track and then I can assess whether you know whether or not it needs to be um handled but uh you know and I I say the same thing too with things like social media one of the Mm -hmm. best things I ever did for myself is I got rid of all notifications on my phone um so I don't get push notifications for Twitter Instagram Facebook anything on my phone period ever. Um, That way I don't feel like I'm bombarded by someone else and feel like I'm beholden to technology or beholden to this app or beholden to this notification or this email. Um, It gives me the control and the autonomy over when I decide I'm going to look at these notifications and see what's going on here. I'm going to look at my email and, and, and respond to these things. It, It becomes my choice. I have control and that has helped so much and I and I tell everyone I talk to to do it because it it will completely change your relationship with technology for the better I'm kind of slowly starting to get into that similar process where I will actually leave my phone in another room um and I just kind of don't want anything to do with it like similarly to you like I will get to a point in my day where I'm just like just don't want to talk to anybody like i Mm -hmm. just want to focus on you know other things and typically uh i'm thankful that we work with some of the publicists that we do that are constantly giving victims and villains 
movie reviews, uh, movies to, to review and, you know, podcast planning and that, you know, this past week, I think I've seen, God, I've seen so many movies this past week. <laughs> and, uh, it's all been for the cause of, you know, mental health awareness and suicide prevention and film festivals. And it's been a blessing for my mental health because it's like, man, it's like, I don't, I don't have to worry about, you know, what's going on with Twitter right now or Facebook or, you know, whatever. And my wife kind of loves it and hates it because like if we're on, you know, opposite schedules, you know, we want to be texting and talking, but you know, sometimes I'm just like, I just don't want the temptation of, of social media. And I just need that separation to take place because I know for me, it's going to be a lot better in the long run. Oh, and you reminded me, it is Sundance week, isn't it? <laughs> yeah, it's like, these social media apps, they already know how to get to us, like, from a neurological standpoint. I mean, the notifications, like you said, Heather, cutting off the notifications is a great way to keep yourself with boundaries from social media because those notifications act like a dopamine push. Mm-hmm. But the thing about dopamine is that as soon as you experience it, then your brain's going to want more. It never lasts too long, and that's... What I feel, that's what I was feeling like lately when I was getting on Twitter. And it's come to a point now where I'm only on there for maybe one or two days out of the week. And even that, it's less than an hour each day because I just want to spend my time like really worrying about if someone's going to like what I post or worrying about like having to like give that that heart to somebody so they can follow me and see what I'm about. Like, you know, there's a quest for social validation that is running rampant, especially among our younger generation now, that it's resulted in the highest levels of, like, depression and anxiety yep. and stress that we've ever had in this, like, industrial world. And I fear that it's going to get worse unless something is done, unless we bring up more awareness about how it affects people and that's why I love what Josh did like when I first met Josh he explained to me exactly what he was planning to do with his podcast he's like I want to raise awareness about mental health like I want to be the beacon of hope for people who who don't have anybody to talk to they could come and listen to me and I could feel like that we're reaching to them through these movies and podcasts like not just talking about the film itself but really getting at the themes and the messages so it can be more applicable for people to follow (laughs) <laughs> preach it preach it preach it so i i am the gentleman that runs the victims uh like almost all of our social medias and i typically will post once a day just to keep uh our algorithm the algorithms running and, and happy and whatnot but uh, I mean, nine times out of 10, like I am posting and I'm off. Like I'm not going to explore. I spend most of my social media now just talking to friends <laughs> um, and, and embracing that community and to kind of bring it back to the little things. Uh, I think it's, you know, one of the, another damaging thing that you can see with the Denzel Washington character is at the very end, there's a scene where they're in the coroner's office and they pull out the bullets out of this uh, female that Denzel accidentally shoots. And Mm -hmm. coroner's basically like, you know, Hey, like I'm just going to put that it was multiple stab wounds that caused this victim's death. And they basically have this like pact. And it's also about surrounding yourself with the right community because community is great, but if you have a terrible influence on your mental health mm-hmm. in the long run, once again, you're going to be doing so much more damage. And that pact that Denzel has created, like, I mean, it, it creates this like awkward it's so toxic. It is. It's toxic. And it's like so awkward to see him kind of navigate around characters like Sal in the corner and, uh, you know, even the, the captain of the LA precinct, because like he knows kind of what happened to an extent, but you know, these guys are around and, and they're like, you know, Hey, we'll, we'll keep your secret. You know, it's like, no, that's, that's the wrong kind of people to surround yourself with. Like what's the worst that's going to happen if you tell someone that you accidentally shot someone because you thought it might've been the murderer. No, no, exactly. And I think that's one of the things that really 
really infuriated me about this, you know, just the storytelling in the film in general. But, but, you know, like this is a thing, you know, people, people hold secrets and hold other secrets and repress very, very toxic red flags. You know, we see it with abusive relationships. We, you know, like it's the people who tell the women to stay in the abusive relationship, right? It's, it's that sort of thing. It's that same, you know, and Denzel's an abuse, an abusive relationship with himself and he's in an abusive relationship with all of these people who like one of the most toxic things is that coroner who pulled that bullet and she fucking carries it on her keychain. Yep. As a reminder of of, <laughs> of of what? Like that is you know, like there's Mark. there's repressing and then there's torturing yourself with this thing that you did every day. You know, I don't know what is worse, but they're both not good. Um, you know, and and like God, just just therapy. All of these people just go to therapy. <laughs> I, I'm so glad you brought up that scene about the keychain. Because he even gets to a point where he's burning the stuff in the very end and he has a flashback to that mention of the bullets and almost actually contemplates keeping the treasure box of Leto's character. And it's like, dude, like you're already torturing yourself with all of these victims. Like, what is it going to do to your mental health to keep a, a keepsake for yourself? Like, how are you any better than the corner and for even bolder how are you even better than leto by keeping a token of your murder mm-hmm. no 100 percent. but maybe <laughs> but maybe this was the filmmaker's way of like saying they're all the same who knows um <laughs> who knows we're, we're all the same we're all sociopathic serial killers on the inside guys oh. yeah it, it, like, it makes me wonder like you know does he ha- is he is he is he just like addicted to like keeping these things around to keep oh, them as a reminder. So. Like I think uh-huh. he's had, I think he has a sick addiction to it. <laughs> no, it's 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 emotional addiction. It's a very very real thing. It's a very very real thing. Emotional addiction, um, mm-hmm. and it's a very very toxic, toxic thing. But mm-hmm. it's the it's that comfort zone, right? He's been doing this for five years now, six years, however long it's been. And so it is his comfort zone and anything outside of that comfort zone, you know, um, is, is scary. And we don't know what the last five years for him has been like, you know, he's this sheriff deputy. We don't know exactly what he's, he's been doing, but ostensibly like, was he, is, is it like emotional rehab? And then, you know, he took his first drag of a cigarette again and now he's in like, we, we don't know. We don't, we don't know if his, new office has the dead girls hung up in it like it does in the hotel room in LA. We don't know. Um, but it is, it is emotional addiction. He is torturing himself for the sake of torturing himself because he feels obligated to, to a certain extent. Um, yeah, no, I, 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 yeah. And I think, and I think that is the one redeeming thing of his arc is when he burns that treasure chest, because keeping it would be him still holding on to these murders that we don't know whether or not just got solved. Um, and it would be continuing to torture him. So hopefully burning it gives him some peace. Although if he did want to give it some peace, I don't know why he would burn it on his own property. That part was weird. Yes, me and my girlfriend <laughs> point to the screen. It's like, why is he burning? Why is he burning this at his place? <laughs> like, right, it is yard. I, I was just like, that's a choice. <laughs> yeah, it, well, it's emotional. I'm, I'm glad you kind of brought it up that way. Emotional addiction, I think, is you know to go back to toxic relationships is something that we see a lot of when you're you know in bad environments. And eventually you get to a point where that environment, it just, you just become numb to it. So like the abuse that you're suffering or the gossip that you're hearing about, or the fact that, you know, you're worthless or just all these lies that people are talking, you eventually just kind of accept it as a new reality almost. And that's an equally dangerous place to be. And once you, you know, you try to make that divorce from the addiction you do go through withdrawals but i promise you that it's you're better off because of it um 
you know, I've been in a few toxic relationships and Kales and I, we have talked about some of the, our past relationships in the past and just, you know, how much better off we are kind of separating ourselves from those and, and not clinging on to them and, and finding healthy ways to take that pain and channel it and bring it into uh, something newer that can potentially also raise awareness and basically have people learn from our mistakes. How would you guys like to help us get mental health resources into schools, conventions, and other events? Well, now you can. Simply go to patreon.com forward slash victims and villains for as little as $1 a month. You guys can help us get mental health resources into current and upcoming generations, educate and break down stigma surrounding mental health, suicide, and depression, and you get exclusive content that you can't get anywhere else. And you guys can tell us which Nicolas Cage movie you want us to cover, and we'll do it. All it takes to get started is to go to patreon.com forward slash victims and villains or simply click the link in the episode description wherever you guys are currently listening or streaming this episode. Pick your tier and get started today. Yes, it's that simple. So quickly select the tier that you want and help us get hope into the hands of the depressed and the suicidal today. it's you know you it's it's a mixture of something that class said earlier it's a dopamine hit you know when you're in an, an emotionally addictive relationship whether it's with a substance or whether it's with yep. um an idea like denzel's is or whether it's with you know whether you're dating a narcissist right you you have a void of dopamine in your system and you're scrambling to try and get that and whether it's oh i finally got the narcissist narcissistic boyfriend's attention and now i get that plug of dopamine well now i'm going to try even harder to to maintain that and hold on to that right it, it is an addiction 100 percent, and that's what we see with denzel in this you know and that's what we see almost i think in a way in that interrogation scene where he almost like what well, well, he does get physical with Leto and he, he almost assaults him in there. It's, you know, it's, I'm so close to this dopamine hit. I'm so close to getting that acknowledgement that we just need, and you can give it to me and you have to give it to me. And, and if you give it to me, you'll solve all my problems. And that's when we see him snap and lose it. It's a hundred percent emotional addiction. Yeah. Um, and he's, he's placing, you know, it's, it's when you place, the um the response you need on something outside of yourself be it alcohol be it drugs be it love be it um a specific response from another person that's obviously very very toxic yeah it's like it's like when you're in touch relationship with somebody you know the one thing that you can that is a hallmark is that there's one person that knows which buttons of yours to push. They know exactly what's going to get you out of of who you are and make you into not really a monster, but just someone who's not someone who is who you want to keep into the dark, but ends up becoming unleashed. And you see in that interrogation scene, Denzel just goes off the wall, and it's almost like he's playing into Jared Leto's mind games and. Jared Leto knows that he has him. He knows that he's fooling with him and toying with him and playing with him and is getting Denzel uncomfortable and making him come out of his element. And what you'll see from a narcissist is that narcissists, they thrive off of that. Mm -hmm. They thrive off of yeah. getting somebody right out their feet. It's like, I got you where I want you because if I can control how your mood is, then I control you. 100%. 100%. It's, it's manipulation. And yeah. it's, yeah, and very it, toxic. Leto is very good at, at kind of manipulating the narrative in the way that he wants to go. And it, I, I think one of my favorite sequences in this movie is when they are doing the stakeout and Romney's character calls in mm -hmm. uh, Leto and he's like, Hey, you know, I'm, I'm sorry for the things went down. Let me buy you a beer. And so he tells him where to go and Leto basically latches onto it and calls the cops on him 
you know, faking an officer down. And, uh, but I want to ask because I, I know Heather, where you stand with Leto, <laughs> but, uh, Leto, I think was my favorite part of this movie. Oh, I mean, he's hmm. extremely convincing as an alleged serial killer. And that's all I'll say about that. <laughs> <laughs> no, but, I mean, he, yeah, I, uh, Y'all know where I stand on Leto. Yes. I don't need to get into it here. Um, but he does a really good job. As someone who has studied, you know, who who studied acting for a very, very long time, the way he holds his body, his movement, his speech, how he, you know, looks at you and looks at the other actors and, and the choices that he made um, were very, very creepy. Um, and you can tell that, he knows he has power when he's in those rooms. He knows yeah. that these detectives want something from him. And because of that, he knows he holds all the power because they have nothing on him but a hunch. Um, and I think one of my favorite moments was when Denzel has been following him all day in that new blue car. And they go to those bridges and he parks on one side and, <laughs> and then they swap bridges and then they swap bridges again. And then it's when he realizes, oh, no, no, he knows that he's being followed. I was just like, this is such that was, I think, one of the coolest moments of the film, this idea of cat and mouse and Leto just very subtly letting him know I'm on to you and I'm three steps ahead of you at all times. It was it was it was it was a very cool choice in the filmmaking there. Also, Leto feels like a very modern character for a movie that's supposed to take place in 1990. I don't know how you guys felt about that, but when they bring him into the interrogation, he's like a bit of a crime junkie. And I, I feel like podcasting and the current age that we live in and just how popular true crime podcasts are and like docu series on Netflix revolving around true crime it he seems yeah. like a very modern actually, character actually actually uh I, I i hear you but what they're going for here and this is what i think is a lot of your uh sociopathic serial killers like your jeffrey mcdonald's your family annihilators back back in the 70s back in the 80s um, they got their ideas for their murders because they read these true crime magazines um, and they were obsessed with them in the news. Um, this is that's actually a, a, a pretty normal symptom that you see in these and in, in serial killers um, or that's even fair. just mass murders or things like that is they they start their obsession by following it in the news, by police scanners, by magazines. Um, and they start fantasizing over that, whether sexually or not. Um, and then they replicate those murders. Um, so that's what I took from it was this is them checking another box of, oh, he's he's a serial killer. Yeah, I feel like now there's also, there, and this is why there's a movement now to where people are telling these news channels like when there's a mass shooting or when there's a murder that goes along, do not release the name of the criminal. Yeah. Don't release yeah. the name of the, of the perpetrator. Because you, you've seen it. We've seen it from Columbine. We've seen it from Virginia Tech. We've seen it from Sandy Hook. Like mm -hmm. When you release the name of these killers, some of these guys will go and like Plant them as their new savior, and then they'll make they'll write a manifesto when they commit their crimes. It'd be like, oh, I was inspired by this school shooter. And I was inspired by that murderer. It, it's it's a copycat, true copycat. <laughs> no, no, it's it's a hundred percent. I can't think of the guy's name. Um, hold on, uh, Luke Luca Magnata. Um, if you guys have heard of that serial killer, um, if you've seen the Don't Fuck with Cats. Mm. um documentary yeah um, oh yes yeah yes. he's a serial killer literally he became a serial killer the reason he became a serial killer was because he was so desperate to be famous and he tried to be famous by being a model he tried to be famous by being on reality tv he tried to be famous by doing youtube videos all sorts of things and he didn't start getting attention until he started posting these videos where he was killing cats online in these fucked up ways and he got that dopamine hit from killing animals which then turned into killing people and he was literally caught and this is my favorite thing he was literally caught 
because he was Googling himself in an internet cafe in France. And the guy there was like, is that you? While reading an article of like this guy who's internationally most wanted. And that's how they caught him because he was literally getting off to how famous he was for killing people. Interesting. I I never have known really, or like looked at back at like true crime patterns predating podcasting. So Mm -hmm. for me, like I am always fascinated to learn about how each generation has kind of processed and really gone through the true crime. uh, No, in the nineties, true crime fetishization was actually a really fucked up thing in the nineties. Like people were buying Gacy's paintings and people were buying, you know, Mm -hmm. here's stuff from Ed Gein's house and people like in the nineties, it was, uh, and this is where I show off my hobby of just studying true crime and an unhealthy obsession. But that's all I do (laughs) in my free time. I know a lot. Um, But the 90s was, you know, this really, um, like, people were, like, selling John Wayne Gacy's paintings for thousands of dollars, which is so fucked up, Um, you know. And and that's why I like the movement that true crime has kind of taken now, where it's all become about honoring the victims and Mm -hmm. talking about the victims and um, not so much about the glorification of the murderers, you know. And we still see it, obviously. You know, there was the um, Confession Tapes Ted Bundy documentary that came out uh, two years ago where everyone is talking about how hot Ted Bundy is, which is oh <laughs> not great, but okay. Um, here we are, 2019. We've come a long way. Uh, <laughs> but... Um, but, you know, like we see things with uh, I'll Be Gone in the Dark, the new documentary and book about the G- uh, Golden State Killer. You know, it's really become about talking about the victims and the survivors. And I think the new Ripper documentary um, on Netflix is a really good job on that, too. Um, so I know this is a little off track, but I could talk about this stuff all day long. No, nah, I mean, you're yeah, you're well you're well placed in what you're saying. I mean, I, I like that now we're not putting the onus and the attention all on the notorious killers we're also remembering the victims because that's what gets lost a lot Mm -hmm. you know especially when it comes to these guys being in court trials the attention is all focused on these guys and you know whether representing themselves and do they have fans like why are these fans worshiping them we always forget about the victims i mean look at the oj simpson trial we forgot all about nicole and we forgot all about ron goldman it just became all about oj and if the glove doesn't fit you must quit (laughs) yeah stupid glove (laughs) <laughs> and speaking of OJ, he just posted a picture of him getting the COVID vaccine yesterday. So, uh, woo? I don't know. <laughs> <laughs> I, so I saw that. I saw that. And I was like, I don't know how I feel about that. <laughs> <laughs> but, but yeah, it's it's super important to remember, you know, it, remember the survivors and the victims and the impact because, yes, these people are troubled, right? Obviously, uh, serial killers um, and murderers are very, very troubled people. Um, but they just breed trauma everywhere they go. Um, and those are the people that have to live with it. You know, like, let's say Jared Leto's character really did you know, we know 100% for a fact really did kill all of those women. Um, Or even if he didn't, someone did. Um, And they're no longer there. Um, The impact of their actions are going to last generations. Um, And that needs to be, those people need to be respected. For sure. Mm Mm-hmm. Well, I'm gonna I'm gonna edit all this stuff out. Is there anything else you guys want to hit on? No, I'm. Um, I mean, I could go back to ranting about John Lee <laughs> and the savior complex. Uh, this, uh, yeah, I mean, <laughs> we'll uh, we'll save that for maybe a Patreon episode. <laughs> <laughs> um, 
Okay. All right. Well. Okay, I'm gonna count down uh to five, and then I'll go ahead and throw us out for social medias and whatnot. Come back in five, four, three. I think that is gonna do it for us on the little things. But uh, just remember that it is the little things that get you caught. And uh, if we want to get caught up in social media, where can people find you online, Heather? Uh, if you were here, I would smack you for that. Um, <laughs> everyone can find me on Twitter at, at Heather Antos. Just my name. It's very, very easy. Um, on Instagram at, at Heather Antos. And I recently started an art Instagram where you can just follow all of my art, which is at Heather art toast so it's uh just an r instead of an n in my name because i think i'm clever (laughs) i mean i think i'm clever too when it comes to dad jokes (laughs) so you know that's that's why i had to throw that little little joke little things joke in there but uh coles where can people find you um, you can find me on Twitter, Instagram, and Letterbox um, under the alias Black Nerd Magic. You can find me on Facebook um, as my real name, Kales Davis, and that spells C A L E S S. And also, if you want to check out some of the other podcasts I've done with Victims and Villains, you can go ahead and do that. It's right in the archives. And also, check out Feeling Film podcast with me, Aaron White, and Patrick. Well, yeah, so it's weird that you haven't done a whole lot with us in 2021 and you're getting yes. ready to take over the podcast again because you'll be back in a few episodes to talk about Malcolm and Marie uh, oh, with me. Just saw that last night, so too. I'm, I'm excited about that. But uh, our next episode, we're going to be dialing in on the weird aliens and football because we're talking about 1998's The Faculty. So make sure that you guys hit subscribe wherever you guys get your podcasts from. Uh, you guys can follow me on Letterboxd at Captain Nostalgia throughout my 2021 film journey, as I've also been posting on our Instagram as well. Uh, we're on Facebook, Twitter, Twitch, and Letterboxd as well, all of which you guys can get links to through our social media, our sorry, our website at victimsandvillains.net, where you guys can find past episodes that Coles and I have done, movie reviews from Coles and myself, and a whole lot of talented other writers, and most importantly, our mental health resources. So that's going to do it for us talking about the little things. Hope you guys enjoyed this conversation, and we'll see you guys next time to talk about the faculty.